Hello and welcome to Romantic Readers Podcast. My name is Nicole and I am joined as always by my amazing co-host Ali and we have a very special guest for you today. As all of you know, we have been slightly obsessed with this book right here and we have been so lucky to bring along today Sarah A. Parker, New York Times best-selling author. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? Um, great, thank you. And thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure and I can't wait to spend some time chatting with you both. <laughs> this book is just like, I don't know, I mean, I think I just saw it on Instagram just kind of explode. It kind of took the world by storm this year. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think we've kind of said this has definitely been one of the, honestly, the best books I have read this year, if not like in all of like the romantic genre that we are obsessed with. Um, it's such a, like a, it's not just your everyday romantic book. It's more like there's such a complex world here. It's so unique and special and there's the characters and there's this whole world you've created, like even the years, how they're measured, everything. Like, how did you, how did you start this journey? How did this book come about? We want to hear all about it. <laughs> oh, look, so this was not an overnight thing you know I this world actually <laughs> came to me like three years ago well actually it's four years ago now uh, I keep yeah. saying three but it's it's <laughs> it was three once I started writing moon so it's about, about yeah. four 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 and a half years now um and yeah so it's it uh, it really was a slow building process you know I gave myself a lot of time with the story before I even sat down and put pen to paper um I really yeah. just allowed myself to love the world and to love the characters and to and to just love the creatures and work out spend time with the law myself and and you know build the world brick by brick before I actually sat down and wrote chapter one um so yeah for me I mean uh, I really looked at this world like a video game I was moving through it you know exploring it and just just I guess just (laughs) gobbling it up uh for so long and I I think for me like the spending that time loving it myself has really allowed it to be this rich world that you know people open open the pages and they feel like they're in that they're in there as well it's because like I I, I took that time with it and really you know allowed it yeah. to have all that love that I could give it so oh, yeah it was, it was a long process <laughs> but the funny thing is when I actually sat down and started writing the story I, um oh actually I lie I I did start twice um got to a certain point and I was like mm, this is not getting myself to these certain chapters that I wanted to hit because I always had certain chapters in my head and so I swiped that twice and started again. But once I once everything really started screaming at me and I sat down, it only took me six weeks to write the story. Oh um, wow. So it just goes to show I think like I I think that that is all tribute to those three years that I spent prior, you know, learning the world, learning how it works and all that sort of stuff. So um yeah, it allowed me to really know my parameters, I guess. Yeah. And it's so I think evident. I love that even though it was probably hard spending that three years just, you know, creating every little intricacy in that world, that is really what makes this unique and what brings it to life is that it's not just about sort of the main characters and a bit of a, you know, a bit of a fantasy world. Like it's in depth. It's like I compare it to like Game of Thrones meets Throne of Glass meets Harry Potter even, like, you know, with little knee that like flies around. I'm like, who would think of that? Like there's just all these little intricacies that make it so rich and beautiful and just add so much to the story. So um, yeah. it's amazing that I, let Ali jump in. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, you know, I have been telling, I have been very open that it is so far the best book I've read in 2024. Oh. Um, <laughs> so I just find it to be so excellent. And to me, the world building in some ways almost feels like a sci-fi in the, the the way that you get dropped right into the world and you have, you know, different names for things. Like even the couches, I can't remember what they're called, but they have a specific name. So um, it, it sounds like you've maybe heard that before or that's something you were going for. Um, but yeah, that was, was that something that you you thought of as you were coming with the world look I, I I knew immediately that I wanted to make this world feel completely different to ours you know that I wanted I wanted my readers to step into the story and feel like they were comp- somewhere completely different and so once I just you know once I re- really leant into that I guess and I started going oh okay well 
food needs to be different. Oh, yeah. the creatures need to be different. Oh, yeah. the name is different. You know, like <laughs> then, I was like, it's oh my golly, how is not interesting <laughs> enough? <laughs> where is yeah. the line here? <laughs> and, it, and it did. I it actually got to the point where I, I did have to draw a line. At one stage, I I had gone a little bit further with it, and through the better stage, um, you know, I was waiting for feedback on certain things that I had also gone a bit further with, and I had to pair it back just slightly because you know when you're introducing readers to a whole new world, like there's a lot to take in and Mm -hmm. so it was about finding that balance as well so that you know the story can still be understood and you know and then of course I've got the um the pronunciation guide and the glossary there as well just in case because I know it's a big lush world like there is a there's a lot of different everything you know but um I mean yeah I I once I started I really struggled (laughs) to stop (laughs) I, I personally loved it. When I opened up that glossary, I was like, because I'll devour a book in like two days. Like your average yeah. kind of book, I'll just just like I'll just drill through it. So to actually get something complex, I was like, okay, I'm here. All right, this is gonna be good. But I was absolutely terrified. When I opened up like my my Kindle and the first like 20 pages was glossary, it was like, oh Holy my gosh. Shit. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've got, got homework to do. <laughs> yeah. What do you what do you tell readers who are maybe a little bit scared by that kind of initial? glossary that they get I tell them to skip the glossary altogether because it's not necessary reading you know it's there if you need it if you like you come across a term and you're like I don't know what that means then you know it's there to flick back to flick through and go oh oh that's what it is you know it's I I I do I I Look, what I like about the glossary is that it gives a more in-depth description of things that I already explain on page. So it's not like I'm, you know, chucking a creature there and not explaining how it looks. Like I'm still doing that in scene, but the glossary gives a more, you know, a more broad sort of stroke of that. And it's really just there as a as a, as a reference, I guess. So people that are struggling, I say, just skip it. You, it's not necessary reading. It does help you to understand, but it's definitely, I mean, I, I feel like a lot of people who read the glossary first it goes out the, out the window anyway you know I feel like it does give a sense of the world it's like oh okay all right shoot okay there's a lot of different things going on here but what is really important what what is most important at the start of the story is the prologue you know that's got yeah. that's got a lot of the very important information that you need to uh, see where I'm going with the story I guess mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. so I would say skip the glossary altogether and dive into that use the glossary if you need to go back pop some little tabs there and you're good to go yeah, yeah, no, hundred percent agree with that. And I and I found I, I tried to absorb all that initially, mm. but I forgot yeah. everything. And probably for the first ten chapters was just kind of just going with the story. I was like, I don't know really who everyone is, but I'm just going with it. <laughs> By about ten chapters in, it all started to kind of come yeah. together, and then it's like you're obsessed. But then I went back, and I bas- basically everyone that have encouraged to read this, I've told them actually read it twice. Because that, that whole first part, it was like reading a whole new story. Yeah. I was just like, mm-hmm. oh, my God, those two characters had a conversation? I didn't even yeah. remember that happening. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so funny because I did I did so much, so much Easter egg laying and foreshadowing throughout the story. So when I, I got to the end and then I went back to the start myself and I knew that I'd done this and I knew that I'd interwoven everything to, you know, to make sure that everything's lining up beautifully with, you know, things that have happened in the past and things that we're discovering. But I was the same for me. I went back to the start and I was re- and I read it again. I was like, oh my gosh, it feels completely different the first time I yeah. went through. So I was like, okay, phew, hopefully that comes across. <laughs> so I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> it's a gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> now, yeah. before I go any further, I have an outline to our audience, not that anyone that watches our podcast knows. We are currently in the spoiler-free zone. So you don't need to be panicked right now. We're not going to give away any major spoilers to this book. So if you haven't read it, Please stay for now. We will let you know when we jump into spoiler zone and that's when you got to jump off and go read the book and then come back and get the rest of the <laughs> juicy information we're going to give. So tell us about like about I guess your writing journey, especially because I'm very excited. You live in Australia, which I do. <laughs> I mean, you're a New Zealander, which you know we're, we're basically you know we're like cousins. We're the same. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My kids are Australian. <laughs> <laughs> My husband's Australian. <laughs> My dog's I'm Australian. Just- uh, yeah, that's it. In, and you're in the part of Australia I want to be in. I'm down in Melbourne, which is freezing it's cold, right, cold now. right now. Yeah, yeah. Oh. It's hot. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, it's quite nice today, but it's been raining. It's been pretty chilly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But what was your like? I want to hear about like your writing journey, and also what it's been like. I guess 
for your writing journey not being like in the US or in the UK where I guess it's maybe, I don't know, it's easier to be kind of connected to those big publishers and things. I mean, what has that journey been like for you? Uh, so I I was initially working on a tr- kids clothing brand and I was sewing myself. So it was just kids clothes, you know, when I, this is, this is when my three children were, you know, three and under. And yeah. so I'm working 17 plus hours a day, like breastfeeding as I'm sewing. And, you know, <laughs> and it got to the point where, um, where my designs were starting to get sort of ripped off on Alibaba and like my pictures were getting taken and stuff. So I kind of reached this pivot where I needed to either get things made overseas and take it to the next level or start listening to these stories that had always been screaming in my head so I remember saying to my husband look I'm and at this stage we had like a 10 our youngest was about 10 months old and um our eldest was three years older than that can't math right now um (laughs) but (laughs) but I remember saying to him look I'm going I'm going to do this I said look if if by the time all three children are at are at you know school mm-hmm. if, um, um, if people don't like listening to my stories and they all keep reading my stories then um I will pivot again but I want to give this a real crack and he said well just, you know go for it so I did I started writing and I my, what I started writing first was actually a so about 400,000 word book that's still on my computer that will probably <laughs> never see the light of day but <laughs> I and this is about at the same time that I started reading voraciously fa- fantasy mm-hmm. romance, and I'd already, always read fantasy as a youngling, as a youngling. <laughs> Look, <see. laughs> this is how in the world we are. We're just we're just embracing it right here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I call people folk at the moment. It's bad. <laughs> so I need to get out of the house more. Getting oh a coffee God, and, and you're like, Wow. Okay, <laughs> there's an insight for you. Um, so as a tro- as a as a tro- can't even say it right as a child um I was you know a huge fantasy reader um but obviously I hadn't really sort of been opened up to the world of fantasy romance until after I had the children so and when I stood start you know reading it and I just found myself and I was like I just and this is what I want to be writing this is what I want to be writing and that really triggered me to go I you know and these stories started really speaking to me and I'd always had stories speaking to me but these were really screaming to me and so that's what I did for for a full year. I didn't tell anyone that I was writing. I just wrote and I taught myself and I learned and I just, I, I worked things out wow. and I did a lot, a lot of reading as well. And, um, and yeah, and then I started, I decided I want to, you know, do some self-publishing. I never tried to, I guess, um, go for any trad pub situations. I, I, I learned about self-publishing and I was like, you know what, I'm just, I'm just going to test this, test the waters here, see if people are even interested in my books. Um, yes. And, you know, just talk quietly, see how I go. So that's what I did. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's been a journey. It's been a, a learning journey. And, you know, I've, there's been a lot of bumps and a lot of ups and downs and, um, and, but yeah, a lot of learning and a lot of, I've, I've always, always been every single book I put out, I'm like, I want to learn something from that. I want to learn something from that. And then when it came to Moon, obviously I had a, I had a fair bit of success with my Crystal Bloom series. Yeah. Um, but I also learned a lot of hard truths with that. And the main one was that I was, I didn't have the right balance with my life. Like I was working, you know, I, I was full-time parenting and yeah. primary caregiver. You know, my husband was leaving four at the morning, coming home at seven at night, you know, um, um, working down a completely different city. And so I I was really just burning the candle at both ends. And yeah. I realized that that wasn't, you know, sustainable. So mm-hmm. about, um, around about this time last year, actually, my husband left work. He said, look, I'm going to, I'm going to give you every opportunity to, you know, to 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 do your dreams. Um, yeah. He left work, and I started writing Moon, which wasn't the book that everyone was waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't tell anyone about it. <laughs> it was calling to you, and you were like, "This needs to exist yeah. in the world. I have to write this down on paper." Yeah, and I'd been sitting in this world for the past three years, so I was. I, but I knew it was now. The story was now screaming at me. I was like, "I need to do this now." And he was like, "Once again, he was like, all right, off you go.'" <laughs> and so I just, I sat down and I just, I spent a month putting all my backgrounds and my lore and my character backgrounds, everything, into a document. And um, then after that month, I didn't look at that document again, and I put that to the side and I started <laughs> writing. And yeah, so uh, that was, 
a very, I guess, a very different way than how I had done things in the past. You know, I'd always sort of like I'd always sort of worked towards deadlines that were, you know, paper thin and um, uploaded within, you know, minutes before I, I had my, my upload deadline for, for Amazon. So, but with this one, I left myself, because I didn't tell anybody about it, I didn't tell anybody until it was fully edited. And um, then I ran an art campaign. And at that stage as well, I had a um, a, a um, agent, Caitlin, and she read it before me and she said, look, let's just pu- just publish it and see, you know, we'll see what happens. And um, she's fantastic. She's over in the US. So she's got, you know, some really great ties with different publishing houses and whatnot. And the day it published, we were on a f- plane coming back from, from Japan where I'd been on a snow holiday with the whole family. And um, she'd said to me previously, look, get, get, get back, have a week to relax, and then we'll talk. And then it published, and then I landed and looked at my computer, and she was like, Sarah, we need to talk now. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get a week. It's immediately. <laughs> yeah. Within a week, I think Avon had, where I'd agreed to go with Avon, and um, we'd, we'd sort of gone through the submission process for the US, and we were going through the submission process for the um, for the UK Commonwealth, and within two weeks, you know, we I was, uh, yeah, I was with Harper Avon and, and Harper Voyager in the UK Commonwealth, and and we were we were off so it was wild yeah wild that's oh, that's so but this is wonderful it sounds like we have a lot of people to thank not just yourself but your husband for giving you the freedom <laughs> and managing the three kids because here I'm also a mum of three kids so I know that ch- I can't even like even if I've got an idea in my brain the idea of actually like kind of crying out some time to actually write is literally impossible so yeah hats off just for achieving that Caitlin yeah. your husband says that like there's a lot of people that have helped <laughs> nurture this to life and it's so wonderful to hear that yeah it was it was such a like, empowering time in my life and it's just been incredible so it, it really did come from a place of love and support the story that's amazing I want to know about rave and con is how I say it is that how you say it in your head as well okay Ooh, nailed it nailed it I love it when I, I really sorry. <laughs> you never know um were they did you discover them were they like fully formed characters for you like what what was their kind of creation like so for me it it works differently for each story sometimes I see a character first sometimes I see a world first with this it was definitely the world first um I saw I saw rave probably about a year and a half before I actually started that very first draft in the world Mm so um uh, but she definitely developed for me like she the way that I first saw her um you know she she's there's definitely more gutsy than I had originally I think you know once Mm -hmm. I got her on page she just kind of went (laughs) you know she just she just got her fists out and I was all right okay She was yeah, just yeah. like, I'm, I'm here and yeah. I'm ready to go. Yeah, I really had to lean into her, I guess, um, her sharpness, um, which once I gave myself into it, I was away. But it was, that was quite it was quite interesting. Um, she's actually uh, of all my characters now, she's the easiest that I that I that I've ever written. But it took yeah. me a bit to be like to I guess um really go oh okay okay all right then like let go a little bit and be like well she's really bloodthirsty so we're just gonna roll with that um but with Khan so I yeah I had I he was interesting as well I originally had a very I guess different idea about how his voice was going to be and so I write all my dialogue before I start fleshing out a chapter um and you know so it really starts off with just dialogue and cues and I had to rewrite pretty much most of his dialogue because what I had in my mind like he 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 just came in and was like no (laughs) no I'm I'm this way so I was very much learning about him with each chapter as as my readers my readers do Mm -hmm. um and it was just such a joy whenever he walked on page I was just like so excited because I was like what's he gonna say next you know like I just loved it I loved I loved writing him because again he really did write himself it was yeah quite amazing yeah well he's such a I mean really let's be honest he's one of like the ultimate MMCs like he's so he just he, all right without giving too much away he really has a strong love for the main character and he is not deterred by that whatsoever throughout yeah. the whole yeah. book which is so yeah 
unique and special you know um and I think was it because like of the two of them bantering with each other that that kind of fleshed out or was it just like almost like he just existed in your brain and he was just like nope I'm not saying that line I'm saying this line like (laughs) how was it for you look I I mean I when I was a a had originally you know written down his dialogue um I he had holdbacks you know he wasn't as open and warm and but then I got in there, I was like, no, oh, no, no. He, oh, he, he really fucking loves her, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I was like, holy shit, okay. <laughs> and I I was just, again, I was just uh, born to that. Like, I just had to roll with it, you know. I, he, yeah, I it just, I can't even explain it. I can't even explain mm-hmm. it, but that's just the way he came. I, I feel like if I had written him three years ago, he may not have come out that way. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think that during this time in my life, you know, all that support and that love around me and that, you know, you've got this, like it really, he just shaped himself into the male he is. So it was just, it was, yeah, it was was quite a journey. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Tell us about the dragons. Huge part of this book, or maybe a part that's still going to get bigger. I'm kind of hoping the yeah, next yeah. one we're going to get even more dragons. But tell yeah. us about like the dragons and even the magic system and some of those sort of interesting aspects to this book. So the dragons, I saw them very early on in my creation stage. So they were part of the of what I guess fleshed out the world for me. Like I saw those moons up in the sky, and I was like, oh, we've got you know, and I knew that the world didn't spin. So they were part of what allowed me to, I guess, weave further into the world and really sort of, you know, work out how everything worked yes. and um, which is really cool. So, yes, we are going to see a lot more dragons in book two, a lot more in book three. Um, we've really only, we've, we've only laid the egg here. So, <laughs> yeah. so buckle up. Um, but, yeah, for those who haven't read, there's three different sorts of dragons. Um, you know, there's the, because um, as the world doesn't spin. So at the top, it's called the burn. It's really sunny. There's the saber scythes. They are very uh, boisterous and scaly and, and you know, look, horns on and very just, very savage. So then in the middle of the world is the uh, Multimores. They are very colourful. They are very feathery. They are they can go everywhere. So they're a little bit more of your daily steed, I guess. Um, but they're not as they're not as boisterous and they're not as cunning as the moon plumes, which are the ones that are down in the shade. So oh. down there they're lustrous. They are um, they they've got um, leather a leathery sort of hide. They've got you know tendrils about them and and a tail that's got these sort of tendrils at the end and they are more sort of I guess elegant and and each of these dragons when they uh, uh, can see their end coming they soar into the sky they curl up and they become they solidify and they become moons oh. so that's when, when you that's talk dragons. about sorry I'm sidetracking here and I'm completely <laughs> sidetracking it reminds me of like the never-ending story like you know like the dragon like, was that an inspiration like no, but I, just, I mean like, I loved it as a kid so <laughs> get a gift <laughs> There's probably a bit of this in there somewhere. I know. I feel like we've got like the typical like kind of scary like throne of glo- sorry Game of Thrones dragons yeah. like up in the burn, and then the molten moles, like I say, they sound like just your generic, just kind of your runner. Like they go everywhere. They're a good sort of working dragon, and then you've got these beautiful moon plumes that are cunning. And oh my god, you just want to hug it. Like, well, I mean, yeah. it's going to kill you up probably, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so are the dragons like the first thing that came for the world for you is that first or- it was the world not spinning you know okay, it being okay. sort of light all the time here and dark all the time here so um but then I saw these dragons because I knew that this world was going to be inhibited by dragons but I was like once I had the world I was like oh okay well hang on it's light there and it's dark there like there's gonna be you know I don't just want I want them everywhere oh they're gonna all need to be different they would have adapted differently so yeah you know, then I was like, oh, okay, so all these, mo- they're all going to be, t- oh, I was like, oh my gosh. And so my brain just fired. <laughs> <laughs> and I was a goner. <laughs> oh, I'm here for it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, without, without giving too many spoilers, because uh, we're still in the spoiler free zone, but what are some of the, what were some of the hardest scenes to write? And then what were some of the easiest scenes to write? So the hardest scenes for me in any book are always, the start apart from this is not counting the prologue um so the start like setting my readers in this world that I've been in for the past three years at the time and Mm -hmm. trying not to overwhelm them I mean that is that is hard for any writer I, I don't know anybody who you know sits down to write the start of a book and is like oh 
you know, <laughs> it doesn't get a little bit overwhelmed with trying yeah. to give just the right amount. Yeah. Um, so that that is that was hard for me. I, I got the first sort of six chapters down and then I had to go back and do, do some rewrites, you know, um, make things a little bit less bogged down and, you know, and try, try and strike more of an, an even, you know, an even, I guess, <laughs> a, a happier, a happier medium. Um, yeah. And it's hard because it is a big world. It is a big, rich world that, you know, for that first part of the book, you are finding your feet as a reader. Um, so I, I was very much aware that, you know, I, I could, I, I still had to give enough that, you know, that that everything would be understood going forward because I knew I had this big story to tell still. So, um, and there needed to be a certain amount of understanding for that all to make sense. Um, so yeah, the start, hard, hard. Like it, first draft was easy, but then I realized that I'd, you know, bogged things down too much and I had to go through and redo it. <laughs> You're like, how do I bring yeah. this up a little Nobody quick? likes rewrites. terrifying my readers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Nobody likes rewrites. And I think at that stage as well, I was very much, okay, I, I would go through and just kind of try and tidy it and, you know, but rather than just setting it aside and completely rewriting. And that's something that I learned to do during this book actually is to actually, no, just, just take the scene, shove it to the side, rewrite it again, and it would always come out better. Um, yeah. So that was a cool, cool learning thing that I learned from the story. But um, my easiest scene, though, and this is very contradictory to what I just said, was actually the prologue. So yes. that is almost entirely the same as my very first draft that, on that particular oh, scene. Wow. And I think it's just because I'd spent so much time in the world beforehand. You know, I had mapped out how everything worked. I knew what, what sort of lines I was scribbling within. And so it just, it just, formed and uh, uh, yeah I again very few changes so yes. yeah oh I can it's yeah because that is such that that prologue is amazing like I think that for me I just got so excited because it, it made me realize the depth of this story in oh, this yeah. world I, guess, yeah. I can really tell that it's taken three years and I can only imagine knowing my own brain what it would be like if I'd sat with a book for three years like this in my head and then I needed to write it I can understand why the first few chapters you probably like for me it would just I just end up going on all these tangents and then yeah. I'd be like no one will even understand yeah. this for me because you'd have so yeah. many little complexities that you'd be like <laughs> yep you want to give everything you know you're like oh you can have this here's this here's this and it's like wait <laughs> somebody can only swallow so much at once you know like yeah. you gotta just just you know so it is about finding that fine balance and it's you know I've got a fantastic group of uh, of better readers now for readers that I just rely on so heavily you know they're fantastic they read my messy first drafts and they you know they're just so supportive and fantastic so um yeah, I'm awesome. very you know very thankful they give me fantastic constructive criticism and yeah it's just amazing really oh, we're yeah. very thankful to the whole team <laughs> yeah all right I um I'm actually I'm I'm writing a book um, for oh, myself congratulations um, that's very very just started but the only person who's right is my husband yeah. and his first kind of comment to me from I gave him the first 10 chapters and he was like it's just too much. <laughs> I can completely understand. He's like, you got to like pace this out, Allie. Like this is too much information. We've all heard it. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed. He's like, I'm overwhelmed and I already knew the world because you've told me so much about it. So yeah. like maybe you need to. But, but it's good because you've got it all there now and you can go and yeah, you can no, and just pick your favorite bits, you know, mm -hmm. and he can mm -hmm. tell you what bits are his favorite. Like honestly, constructive criticism, even though it's really hard to hear and it, yeah. it hurts, you know, like it's especially with us all. <laughs> it's, yeah, like, I, just, I want you to love it. I want exactly. you to love it right away. <laughs> yeah, but the story's there. You've just got to, you know, it's like you've got to sometimes just lump the clay on and then, you you know, then you can start shaping then it up. And, to, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Lengthen yeah. things out a little yeah. bit. <laughs> yeah, and any constructive criticism is like, is like, you know, spun gold really. It really is because, yeah. Yeah. you know, every single piece of advice comes from, comes from somewhere. Like there's always a fix to everything. Like even if it's not necessarily something that you agree with, you know, it's like, oh, I didn't really like this. The reason that they might not have liked that is because something might not have been done earlier that makes what you were trying to do hit the way you wanted it to hit. So mm -hmm. it's like, I'll look at every piece of constructive criticism and go, okay, all right, and I'll mull on it. Sometimes the answer doesn't come straight away, but it's all just gold. It really is. So, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Helps yeah. create it into something that we all fall in love with. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are we ready for the spoiler zone? I think I'm ready. I, are we you are. Ready, yeah. I was going to say, if you've got any final questions, because otherwise I want to jump in the spoiler zone. I cannot keep like yeah. my lid on this for much longer. So. Yeah. So I'm the same way. <laughs> 
No, we are going to give Sarah I'm a bit of a, like, a, few of, a few of our questions here are going to be like too much. She's probably going to be like, I really can't answer that, but we will totally understand if she says, I cannot answer that. I have to pass it. But we still may ask the question and look for like her, like, you know, facial reactions in the time. So um, <laughs> thank you for agreeing to answer our questions. <laughs> My pleasure. I'll do my best. (laughs) If you have not read the book, this is your warning. Jump off now and go read it because it's fantastic. And then come back and finish the rest of the episode. Okay. So tell us about that ending because Kazari (laughs) is with the scavenger king and Faya has just confirmed that like Kazari's parentage and like, tell us about that. What happened? What can we maybe expect from the sequel? Like, what was going through your head when all that happened? (laughs) So those two final chapters are very much, a, I guess, a taster for where we're going with the story for book two. Um, So it it was my way of saying to the reader, you know, Here's this is this is our next direction. Buckle up. <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> and we went, what? <laughs> I was actually kind of was that? Down to, this was actually one of the most satisfying reads I've had probably. Like there's a lot of books that leave you on a real, like a real painful cliffhanger where you're like, yeah. no, I'm like, you know, like they're about to die. And you're like, this didn't yeah. end that way. It ended like I don't know it was like satisfying you know the way that like you know rave like got it got you know she killed off rex so that, yeah. that was great and then and then we kind of had this little extra like oh oh my god mm. stuff's happened more's coming it's yeah. uh it just left us desperately wanting more but also just being like super satisfied with the story I don't know that was how I came out which was yeah that's how I felt and yeah. awesome I'm glad because that was the intention. It was it was always like I know it's like a heavy cliffhanger because it feels like the start of the next arc. You know, it's like oh shoot, here we're going. That's that's the direction we're heading, and holy heck! But but it really is like I, I intended to kind of wrap up that arc with with you know with Rick. Like I I intended that to sort of close off and then us be like here okay this is here we go here I am just peeling back the pages a little bit of where we're headed in this next in this next leap so Mm -hmm. um yeah I I I that that was very intentional I with each book in the series there is going there is you know there's an overall arc for the overall story um but with each book there is definitely an arc that we're we're going on and tying off at the end so Mm -hmm. um yeah yeah. yeah. So yeah, buckle up is all I can say. I love to hear that. I love to hear that. Literally, barely scratched the surface. So yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. oh. So the next question, I am is a bit of a. It's not a tangent, but I'm going to amend it a little bit from our outline, Nicole. So I, you know, so much of book one is about Rave discovering, you know, who she is and her history and the reader going on along for that journey and that mystery as well. How, from your perspective, how, if you can tell us, mm-hmm. how are Rave and Eluin different? Oh, they, they vary. So I, I, I look at them as very, as two completely different characters. Yes. Um, I, I really don't look at them as the same, as the same being at all um they to me are completely separate um they've you know rave has got her own her own stuff that she's dealt with in the past her own way of dealing with with pains um in some ways i guess elowen is was more advanced with her emotions but in other ways you know um rave rave's definitely got a lot of learning to do because she's come into this she's come into this this life hard you know and Mm -hmm. it's we'll learn more about that in book two um but in a lot of ways as well elowen was very it was was there was a certain immaturity there that um i guess rave has not got you know um because of some of the stuff that she's been through so um and because of the way she was brought into this world um so yeah there are that to me they are very very different different characters and um um so yeah I don't know if that hopefully that answers your question <laughs> no yeah I think it I think it does yeah I mean I I see them as being very different and so I'm excited for Rave's journey uh to reconcile yeah yeah her past you yes. know for herself yeah. and kind of what that means for her romance with Khan and, and all those things so absolutely yeah. there's a lot yeah. of growth to happen there yeah Oh, absolutely. And I'm sure that's going to be a big part of the next book. So I'm sure you can't get too much of it away. I'd love to like break it down into more detail, but I'm sure that's all to come um, when we get to the next segment. Um, Can you tell us more about 
um, Eluin's dragon, um, Slatra, which hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Um, and, and I guess maybe that relationship they had, um, I don't know if you can tell us more about how they become moons and things like that, but like that just whole thing just kind of fascinates me. And I'm like, wait, how, how does it work? Like, how does it, you know, come together that they end up, I don't know, his dragon decides to take, uh, do many dragons take humans up to, to become moons or sorry, I should say Faye. Um, yes. It's a- <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> It's happened twice. <laughs> it's happened twice. And okay. Do we, did we know that? Or, no, yes, yes, we know that. No, no. no we, okay. I, I'm, now I'm like, I don't remember a second instance. I'm going to have to go and like read back through the book and find that second instance. Eloan's brother. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh. Yes. I, okay. It like didn't click for me that that's what happened. Um, so that that's like, okay, I'm so glad that we asked that question because now yeah. it clicked for me. Yeah. And can yeah, you tell no, us no, about, about like, like, I guess, I guess some of the different dragons that we sort of are introduced to, like, like the, like Slatra, Khan's dragon, like some of their personalities and some of the things like that they, I don't know what maybe drives them as a dragon. Are we going to learn more about them in the next book and yeah. their personalities? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot more, um, the book one, we really didn't, we only touched on the dragons, you know, we really did. We only got a bit of a taster, um, obviously a lot in the flash, uh, in the, um, in the diary entries. Um, we had bits and pieces there, but still we didn't really get to immerse ourselves. Um, book two and book three, uh, very, very much more dragon orientated. So um, book one, I, I kind of see book one as we are learning about Elowen and you know rave and how 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 this came to happen how this came to this current day how this current situation came to be you know um so it's we're really setting the stage in book one um as opposed to um you know the actually interesting thing is so originally book one was book one plus book two but I learned very quickly in my in my drafting stage that there was going to be there was too much story here for me to you know for me to round it off in in one book and so I reshaped things so that we had you know this this revenge arc in one and then we're we're moving into this next arc in book two um but yeah there's there's a lot more to dig our teeth into um with with book two so I'm I'm really excited I don't want to give too much away because there's no. just there's just so much there and I don't want yeah. to ruin anybody yeah. but there's yeah, there's yeah it feels like it's such a it was just like an appetizer it was just like the entree it, it did feel that way and I think there was such an excitement um I, I keep going back to saying you know Game of Thrones but like you know how like when that started in season one we actually you only get an introduction to the world really it's only like it's and you kind of have this excitement of what is going to come and I think yeah. that's what makes it really exciting what I'm actually curious what have been some of your I guess inspirations for the for your books like have there been any particular book series or tv shows or that that have inspired you with these books I gosh nothing that I that I can go yes that was you know that was this or that was that I mean I've, I've I loved Aragorn growing up you know I that Ooh, was yeah. my real introduction so to fantasy <laughs> and I just I flew through those books and so I like dragons have been you know have really sat with me since I was since I was very young um so I I, I definitely feel like I've 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 taken a bit of dragon from there you know and I've and I love I've loved watching the whole game of throne series like my husband and I every night one would come out we would be we would be there right on the edge of our seats watching the moment it came out and you know that whole journey with Daenerys and her and her, and her dragons was just oh I just oh you know yeah and just could never watch when there was a dragon dying I just couldn't <laughs> oh I would literally like, run around screaming with my fingers in my ears like can't watch so it's the same with House of the Dragon I'm like I can't watch when they die um okay, hopefully anyway. that gives us some security that all dragons will be safe in your books for future books <laughs> Or if you do, you, you're going to cause yourself as much anguish as us as readers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, golly. But no, oh. I'm a mad keen. Well, I mean, apart from maybe season eight, because I felt like they probably could have done that one better, but I loved um, Game of Thrones and then House of the Dragon. I think that's been our, our current obsession in our household, certainly at the moment. But um, yeah, mm-hmm. I definitely cannot get enough dragons in my, yeah. my books, in my TV shows. Um, they can just keep them coming because yeah. they're, they're just so fascinating. And I think it's one of the things I'd love to know more about as well. Now that we're in the spoiler zone, to hear more about, I guess, the magic system and how it works. I'd love to hear more about, I mean, because it's, it's so in-depth. There's these, well, I guess there's like 
you know, there's obviously multiple magic that people can, you know, um, have. They're all tied to sort of a god. Can you just tell us more about that? Because it's so fascinating. I just want to hear your perspective on it. Yeah, sure. So, so the creators, they've each got their own, their own uh, language and, and those who can hear these, these different, you know, creators, um, some can only hear one, some can hear none, obviously, um, some can hear two, some can hear three and very few, uh, can hear, you know, four. Um, so, um, and then, <laughs> no, I'm not going to go into that because it's a spoiler, a uh, really big spoiler. Um, <laughs> Yeah, like, I know what you're talking about, but we won't go into it. <laughs> no, we won't. Um, so, um, yeah, so the the amount of control somebody has over these over this of being, of being able to communicate with these different creators is depends on how well they can hear them, and you know everyone can hear them at a different at a different you know yeah 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 so it's 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 that plus also um you know being able to actually pay attention learn the language like nobody can sit down and say they teach you know you've only got them to talk to about this so you've it's about learning to speak and to and to actually communicate as well with that creator so actually i guess honing um this the uh, honing these languages in this world and this power it's and this this control over these different creators it, it's not easy so rave i don't think it's um and i you know i haven't i guess shown it so much in book one but uh, rave's control over claude like it is it's 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 really like the, the amount of control she has over her is is in this relationship that she has with her is very uh what's the word uh rare it's it's very rare like it's she's quite spectacular with that um so yeah so these different creators obviously that are, are i guess their languages are harder to harder to comprehend and to and to speak with and whatnot so um yeah it, that all obviously it's it creates that these different you know these different levels of of ability and whatnot of magic yeah um so the way i kind of um see it as well is i you know, because uh, so say for instance, there are two there are two folk who are both speaking with with Claude, um, and the way I see it is almost like an octopus, right? So say Claude's an octopus, and <laughs> and she's got these different arms, and and this one's being controlled this way, and this one's being controlled to do this, you know. So it's very much like it's not like Claude against Claude, but it, it's it's like these different sort of I guess limbs of her kind of working from with each of these different you know yeah. i guess controllers um but yeah so I, I in in the world obviously there's um you know there's the ones with um that we have you know three beads they're very they they are very top high right, ones yeah. with four are basically unheard of so um yeah i, I hopefully that helps a little bit right more. it does and i think yeah. I, mean, and I think it's so interesting because i think we do get that impression that firstly that rave has this really great relationship with Claude. Mm. like she's kind of got this i love Claude. like they just they they, they bond they get each other like yeah. and, and yeah. i think that's all she's willing to like accept for herself right now yeah. um and so you can see that and then she obviously has a bit of a relationship with boulder but she's sort of a bit like oh, i don't know you know she sort of uses it sparingly when she wants to and i think there's a really interesting line that she obviously can hear rain, like if not more. We also have a very good indication that she can also hear um, Ignos as well, but that's like been probably explored at a later date. But with rain, it's, not, it's discussed that it's very hard for people to control rain, that the, the crying, the the intensity, it's it's a yeah. very, very mm-hmm. dif- difficult yeah. um, language to learn and to manage. Yeah. And to manage your emotions as well, like you've got to go deep, for, deep to be able to speak with Rain. So, um, and uh, and Rave in book one, you know, she's she's not very good at going deep. You know, she wants to keep everything surface level. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> locking it out. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> stay on the surface <laughs> stomp in the surface yeah so yeah. um yeah it's she's you know and these and these to her, her relationship with these different creators you know and how they evolve and adapt you know it, that will it's it's you know going to very much kneel to her i guess psychological journey and her and her as she moves through trauma and whatnot as well so yeah yeah are you able to tell us any more about this metaphorical lake that frozen lake that rave uh likes to stay on the surface of (laughs) um so with her with her icy lake i i saw it as a big beautiful nod to her other um 
and for one but two it was for me it was very metaphorical it was very much for her like you know it, and to be fair I deal with trauma in the same way I just stuff it all down and I just pretend it's not there but it is there it still weighs you down mm-hmm. you know it gathers <laughs> builds up and sometimes things topple over and then you're a mess mm-hmm. so you know I I saw it as this kind of uh, this very beautiful metaphorical way um, for her to be dealing with things so we see a lot more of it in book two um, and um, yeah we there's yeah I don't want to say more but yeah <laughs> what <is her>? right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was very interesting because when it was like reading it like when when the other did like no when the other had been out and then she kind of came to and then she was like oh the, the lake's all broken up and I need mm. to like pack it all down again and I was just like wait is it a metaphor or is it like real could this be like like my brain just exploding with like is this maybe her control of rain and maybe she can like ice it over or something like whoa what's going on like my brain's just exploding with is this a metaphor is there something more but I will be very excited to hear more about that in the next book it's exciting to hear but um we can stay tuned for more on that one Mm -hmm. okay I'm curious to know more about the ether stone and obviously this holds the god. I hope I say this right. Kalis, is that how we say it? Yeah, Kalis. Yeah. Um, We're nailing it today with our pronunciation. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it seems to be locked in this. And I'm just it's very fascinated. It's obviously, it's a very fascinating part of the book. It's a how it seems to drain sort of the the host that's wearing this crown. It's it's a, quite a weight to bear for the people that have to oh, wear yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. It is this. Uh, it is kind of seen as a privilege, but it's very much not. Um, so <laughs> I can't really give too much away on this. Uh, no, just fine. know that we, <laughs> there's a lot more to be explored and a lot of that is done in the next book and the book after. So uh, watch this space. <laughs> <laughs> oh, exciting to know. <laughs> okay. I want to talk a little bit more about Khan. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about him and how much he is just so in love with, with Eluin. Can you tell us more about what he's been doing for the last hundred years? Is that something we're going to learn more about? Um, yes, we will. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been, look, it's been tough for him, but what I, what I love about Khan is that he has been through a lot of trauma in his life. Um, but I love that he his heart is still warm and big and he's still got this yeah. unconditional you know a never-ending space for love um so yeah we're, we're absolutely going to learn more about his past um that's coming but um he yeah he's he's had it tough he's had a really tough time um and you know rave is going to come to learn exactly you know what he's sort of been through over that time um but yeah, so more on that to come. <laughs> Sorry, I <laughs> wish I could give more. No, That's we okay. always have fun. Um, so I'm like, yeah, like even Vaya was so interesting in this yeah. and going and finding like Rave's diary at the end and having that mm-hmm. obviously big reveal. Um, can you tell us more about, about Vaya as a character? Because it feels like she's also going to be possibly a pivotal part for sort of the future books to come as well yeah yeah so she's got a very pivotal pivotal role to play in the story moving forward uh, there's a lot of secrets there that uh, need to be unpacked and um yeah she's I love writing Vaya she was she was a great opportunity for me to I guess um you know show more of the world not only not only you know she's integral in the story but she was able I was able to show more of the world through her as well which I loved and because I love being in her head she was she's a fantastic character um you know the moment I sort of I could I could just see her like with this you know just swaggering around and I just but there's just so much more beneath the beneath the skin as well and um yeah that we get to explore in book two and onwards but um yeah, so buckle up because uh, she's she's got some very important chapters in the next book and a very important role to play. So, um, yeah. <laughs> right. I, I should ask this in our rapid fire questions, but I feel like I want to ask it now. Who is probably the toughest of the FMCs? Like, is it is it Rave? Is it Kazari? Or is it um, Faya? Like, who would kind of like, they would put side by side, who'd be kind of like the toughest one? Oh, Rave. Could, <laughs> Rave, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, Bea, Bea is, she she comes across as tough and she she is, but she's also there. She's got some real vulnerabilities. So does Rave, to be fair. But if we're talking about who is going, who is most likely to take down an opponent, it is absolutely Rave. 
<laughs> you want rave in your corner, right? You want to go yeah. you want her in your yeah. corner. <laughs> oh, and I feel so sorry for rave. Like poor rave. Like the very beginning, like like we, she just she sounds like she's already had this traumatic past, and then we just get introduced to kind of her best friend at the start of the book, and then the best friend dies. That's and messy. I was oh. not prepared for that whatsoever. I was not prepared for that at all. It really. I, I talk about it on the podcast all the time, like the sucker punch moments where I'm like, yeah. oh, and like, you know, that was a sucker punch moment for me. For yeah. Sure. My husband actually, he read that part just the other day because he's, he's reading it, the story for the first time at the moment. And, um, <laughs> he was not happy with me. You know, New York Times <laughs> bestseller. Okay. I guess I'll read it. <laughs> I guess it's good enough for me now. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah no it's, it's quite funny though because it's and it's good because he's you know he he's he's great at giving me feedback and whatnot but um yeah he, he called me and he ran to me for like 15 minutes straight like after he met he was like what the like, <laughs> why would you do that <laughs> uh, yeah so yeah look that that poor Ray. yeah she's been through uh a lot of shit and a lot more that you know we're, we're yet to see from what she's been through and whatnot so um lot yeah she's got a lot to work through but, but a lot of healing a lot of healing yeah. to do yeah. yeah which which Khan will totally help with because he's like so so loving and that's why I loved that line where you know because she was I, I we talked about this on one of our other podcasts about how we love the moment where what she got really drunk and then we find out later that she like told him oh I actually like really like you but I don't want you to die so that's why I'm not telling you like I just we adored that we were like we actually could have seen that in real time oh yep yeah. oh look she's she's working through some shit <laughs> yeah but he's he's you know he's he's just again he's just the epitome of unconditional love to me and I just that's what I just love about him is he is unshakable you know and um I, yeah it's just uh I just, I just love him I love him <laughs> yeah when he says it's not your job to to you know to like look after me like that's yeah. don't you worry about that that's on me like you just yeah. need to like you you love who you love girl like which yeah. we're yeah. of course <laughs> going Yes, yes, love him, love him. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, she can be she, in that moment. He's giving her permission to not, you know, yeah, he's yeah. he's saying to her, Don't worry about me, like, yeah. you take care of you. And I just that to me, that is so emblematic of unconditional love, yeah. You know, in yeah. Our and should we also point out and say a big thank you because okay, we love a bit of spice in our books, and this had. Some fantastic spice. And what we particularly talk about, Ali loves what she calls a little ginger treat, which is where <laughs> earlier <laughs> on in the book, like you kind of know there's going to be a slow burn. You're probably not going to get it till later on in the book. But yeah. we get to like, what is it, like 50% of the way through the book where they, you know, in the cabin yeah. and all of a sudden it's on like Donkey Kong. And yeah. you're just yeah. like, oh, out of nowhere. Hello. <laughs> She's going to kill him. And next thing it's all hot and steamy. We were just like, I am here for this. It is, that is like the epitome of my, that if I could say this is the definition of this like crazy term that I use called ginger candy, yeah. it's that. It's where it's yeah. like, you just get a little something to be like, you get a oh, suck. Okay, you get a little right. suckle. <laughs> <laughs> you can eat the rice later. <laughs> the kick is time to hold you over to you know you can get to the big moment well it's funny because I mean I, I'm a I'm, I'm a sucker for slow burn I love I love snow burn I love I love spice with a meaning you know I love yeah. for it to for when it hits for it to for it to be part of the emotional journey with with the couple and um so you know that but that that scene very much was you know it was I feel like it really knelt to Ray's her own where her head was at as well yeah. you know because she's she's very much like she doesn't know what to do with these emotions with these things that she's feeling you know she's really sort of you know so she's she's just doesn't know how to handle things and then <laughs> she's like, do i want to fuck, fuck him it's like, yeah. it's like she's trying to decide between the two <laughs> exactly yeah. and it's just uh you know and I, I just i loved i loved how he dealt with her in that moment and how he was like you know <laughs> I, I i just yeah so i it's interesting because i um 
there's certain certain I guess spice scenes where I, I'm like, oh, there might be an, an opportunity for for there to be spice in this area. Like I, I never I never sort of plan out a spice scene. I'm like, if I get to this area and we're feeling it, then I will I will follow the character there. Um, but if we get to that area and we're not, it's not happening emotionally. I'm I don't, I don't go there. You know, I don't force it in just to get spice in the scene. Um, so yeah, that one. There was actually one. Are they one after their actual sex scene later on? The one where <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't there. <laughs> that was not there. Uh, but I, I got into that chapter with Raven. I was like, wow, this is happening. Okay. <laughs> She's growing up she a hard and be there. She yeah, had a certain yeah. power play to to push across to yeah. kind of set an agenda, and she did, yeah. she went there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, we loved it. Well, have you got any final questions, Ellie? Before I feel like we need to jump into the pass or answer questions so that poor Sarah can just be like, pass if we've gone too far. And <laughs> she doesn't yeah. have to try and look uncomfortable and be like, I can't answer that. <laughs> yeah. Spoilers. These questions, we phrase them much more directly. So yeah. the other questions were like, what can you tell us? This is like, can you tell us this or not? And you're like, pass or yes. And here's the information. So right. we'll kind of go through these hopefully pretty quickly and then we have actual rapid fire questions later yeah. so right. feel free to um, like add more detail if you want to because yeah of course totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> were we right in seeing some potential romance vibes happening between khan's dragon and the new moon flu there's very much a protective vibe in that moment that's all they really cared about um yeah he's he's very uh, the epitome of i guess alpha alpha dragon and mm-hmm. he saw her in pain and it tore him up um so that's what i'll say about that oh <laughs> so beautiful i loved it so much yeah. okay rave has an extreme fear of fire and we learn that she was tortured by the scavenger king arkin um who now has kazari can you tell us more about the under king and his importance to the future story i can't but i can tell you you're going to learn <laughs> all about him in the next book <laughs> 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 can you tell us more about how the bonds between dragons and their writers work um in particular i'm really interested in this sort of like extra special bond that's mentioned between khan and his dragon um the word escapes me so i'm hoping i'm sure you'll, you'll remember it um so I'm, I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit more about that or or not <laughs> oh, i will leave that to book two you'll learn a lot more about all that in book two it's all coming okay up. All right, that's a pass. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Um, what is going to happen with the Black Stone? With the what? Sorry, the Black Stone. Uh, the Ether Stone. Oh yeah. I'm. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I can't tell you that. <laughs> we knew what we were doing with these questions. Don't worry. She's <laughs> gonna get like twenty passes. She's gonna be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, is the prophecy from the Joko clan about Rave's children keeping the moons in the sky, I'm not going to ask if it's true, I'm going to say is it like more widely a prophecy? <laughs> there is definitely a reason it's there. Okay. Okay, yep. good to know. Okay. That's a good answer. Can you tell us more about the war between the brothers, like the, the kings of the, the, the three different areas? Like, are you able to elaborate on that at all about kind of what's happened between them so so far? Why there's such animosity? They're, the twins are very much uh, not not against each other. They are very much, you know, they're, they are, they're, there's, there's not a animosity between them at all. But... Khan, he 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 killed their father, and he's you know he's there's also certain things that uh, uh, certain other brothers are aware of, and so there are there is heavy animosity there. Um, that's all going to untangle in the next book and the one after. Um, so yeah, there's a lot a lot to unpack there, a lot to unpack there. Um, um yeah i guess the father you know he had this idea about his his bloodline being in control of the entire world and that is that has now happened (laughs) and um but you know it's we're very much um yeah it's everything's that unfold maybe not the way that it was anticipated because khan's not quite following the the plans 
Well, he was never meant to be on any any thrones, so it was very much going to be um, their their father and then the twins on the other two. So, um, yeah, so interesting things to come. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, we kind of get into it, or maybe maybe we're wrong, but assuming that the other is Slatra. Mm-hmm. or connected to Slatra in some way. Can you confirm that for us, deny that for us, or pass? I <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, look, I feel like anyone who's read the book twice, like there's a lot of foreshadowing that I've put through, and I feel like um, if you've read the story twice, there's a lot of little hints there that point in the direction of, and I'm going to answer this, going to answer so no one wants to know, cover your ears. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> perfect uh, yes we yes. have read the book twice we both like read it and then immediately re- re-read it because we were so obsessed um and so I'm so happy to have that confirmed yes yes and I mean I felt like it was I don't know I would I would be extremely surprised if you said oh psych it was actually something completely different yeah, yeah, right. it's really obvious <laughs> yes. that it was flat track oh, no. just and she's yeah. so protective of Raven and you know Lewin at the time and I think it's really beautiful I can't wait to see more about how that's all come to be and find out more about that creation and yeah. Ray's backstory and I think there's gonna be a lot of exciting things to come and hopefully you're gonna really enjoy book two. Oh, I cannot <laughs> wait as I said I feel like we've only had the appetizer main course is next like or maybe yeah. main course followed by an additional main course like it's gonna be exciting we've, we've only really done the salad you know we're not even fully yeah. past the salad yeah actually i've yeah. got to we've ask got have, you, main course. have you confirmed because is this potentially a three book series have you confirmed the size of like is it definitely three books or is there potential it's going to be more than that like i if i can uh, so it depends if I can fit all of book three into book three. Um, I know, I definitely know where I'm ending up at the end of book two. And, um, but it depends if the same thing happens with the third arc that happened with my original first arc, you know, it stretches out and then I had to split it in two. Um, I, the, the, I, I don't see it stretching beyond three. I see I, the, the way that I have, because I did reshuffle a little bit to make sure that I've got more I guess being pushed forward in book two than I originally had in the second half of book one before it was, you know, split. So um, yeah, I, I don't see myself stretching beyond three books. There'll, there'll be three thick books. Like the next two will be thick, and the first one was already thick. So um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I really. I was, I was going to say as well. Like I really love the um, the I guess the. Uh, you know how there's this three different territories, there's three different sorts of dragons. I really love. Yeah that as well and also I'd love to have it wrapped up in the three books but if I can't do what I won't but it's I, I see it being wrapped up in three books yeah 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 because it's such a dive like it's such an immense deep world I could see how it's the kind of world that you could continue to explore and, and not just that forever. You know, I could and I could see you exploring alternative characters going right yeah. let's now explore this character in this world and yeah. that character in this world it's like because it's such a immense yeah. world yeah there's just so much you could explore so it's very exciting so hopefully we get we're very excited to get nice three another two big thick books and then we'll see what happens from there okay can you tell us more about the silver saber scythe that lives right up no in that- not right now not right now <laughs> We can discuss that at a later date. <laughs> okay, that's what we needed to know, though, because we have some we have some book theories about the Silver Saber Scythe, and so the fact that you passed is like, okay, we might yeah. be onto something with our theories. Yeah, I love I love the Silver Saber Scythe and how like terrifying it is that even like Khan went to get like just a single scale and nearly got yeah, killed by this that. thing. Like it's extremely big and powerful and scary. Yeah. Like it's, um, I don't know, it's going to be fascinating to learn more about this particular unique kind of dragon that is yeah. up there. Mm-hmm. Okay. It seems like Kazari is talking to Kalis. Um, does this mean that she can hear his song? Uh, not while she's in that dungeon. She's trying. She's she's talking to him, but she can't hear him back at that point. But Ooh. yes, she can. She can. She can. She can. Hear him. Yeah, generally, generally, but she's got she's cuffed an iron. So, okay. uh, yes, yes. Oh, I know because that part's so heartbreaking. Like she's talking, and that that like where I reread that only last night again, and just went oh, like she's 
like, I mean, I obviously kind of know there's a relationship there because she says she's in love with him, which was very bizarre. I was like, okay, she's in love with us, Joan. That's, that's interesting. Yes. Like, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you'll learn more about that in book two yeah okay um did you want to ask I think the next question is yours do you want to ask it yeah I will can you tell us when princess Kazari sent the I need you letter to rave uh it was five phases before um before rave found me Sorry, sorry, hang on. Five phases before we we see Neon Page. So she's, it's been recent. It's been recent. You it's know. been relatively yeah, recent. Yeah, because oh. Ari's been struggling with some stuff and um, she sent yeah. a quiet note out to the void, you know. Yeah. Not, not obviously anticipating that it was going to land in Rave's hands, but she sent a yeah. note out, yeah. And I love how beautiful Kazari's handwriting is. Yeah, and then it's very interesting. I'm sure you can't say anything about it because I'm sure it's a part for a future book. But how Rave struggles with her writing. She's, oh, you know, I can relate to this. I have really unneat writing as well. But she <laughs> talks about she's trying so hard to have this beautiful neat writing, but it's out. It, it's very broken up, and it's not that beautiful neat kind of calligraphy yeah. kind of writing we see from everyone else. Even from Aluin from before, we, you know, you really have explored the different ways of writing but I don't know if you can say anything about that but I thought that was very fascinating I just can't wait for you to read book two (laughs) (laughs) all right we're gonna put the finish this session up so we can put you out of your misery and jump into rapid fire questions which will be painful thank you so much for answering our pass or answer questions we definitely got a few little exciting little snippets in there we um we just As per before, we cannot wait to read book two. We're very excited about what's to come. But thank you for answering our questions as best you could. Of course. Okay. Last session is, okay, so we've got our rapid fire questions. This is a game we like to play with our authors that come on here. Um, The aim is to just answer these as quickly as possible. Um, We, you can obviously give a little bit of explanation, but the goal is to try and answer them as quickly as possible. And of course, if there's anything in here you can't really answer, obviously you can say pass as well. Um, Are you ready? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> <laughs> We're putting you through the ringer today. <laughs> it's like, geez, never coming on this podcast ever again. <laughs> no, I love it. It's great. Okay. What is your favorite type of MMC? Hero, morally gray, or villain? Oh, morally gray. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gotta love a morally gray. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you like a happy ending where everyone lives happily ever after or a tragic ending that breaks the reader's soul into a million pieces? <laughs> <laughs> I like the perfect blend of both. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> it's definitely a good answer. Do you prefer a magical FMC with no physical strength or a physically strong FMC with no magic? Physically strong FMC with no magic. Which is a little bit like our rave kind of. I mean, she doesn't mm. have magic, but yeah. yeah. Um, if you could pick a dragon, which one would you pick? A moon plume, a say the Sabre Scythe, or a Molten Moor? Moon plume. They just look so cuddly. Like, I, I feel like a Sabre Scythe is big and scary, but I don't feel like it'd be as comfortable to ride. Like, <laughs> Oh, oh, oh my gosh, I love it. I love that so much. <laughs> a, re- a, re- a reader gave it to me at um at um a polycon. <laughs> so now she sits next to me. That's oh, so nice. Gorgeous. Yeah. Well and they're cunning. I would want to have the cunning dragon. That would be oh, yeah. what I would pick too. Oh, look, they just look Slatra and Alum just coiled up in my heart and sort of nestled in there and solidified and now they're stuck there. So <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can you tell us in if in your books dragons can crossbreed? No, not right now. <laughs> <laughs> what are your ultimate MMC physical looks? Tall, dark and rugged or blonde chiseled with piercing blue eyes? Tall, dark and rugged. Love it, me too. Um, if you could be someone from your books for one day, who would you be and why? Rave. I feel like I could learn some learn some shit from her. <laughs> <laughs> She's just, you up. yeah, 
you know, she's I got mean, some thick like, skin. Like, <laughs> dispose of a body. Like she, she just has all the life hacks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and like, I would just like to be able to speak my mind as well as she does, you know, to be able to stand in front of uh, those that are, I guess, condemning you. <laughs> And and on trial and to tell somebody he has a micro <laughs> a little yeah. oh such a great moment. It's such a great moment. Oh, I know, I know. She has no fear. She's about to die and she's just yeah. like, Oh well, I mean, oh yeah, that's like a really bad way to die. Kind of pray the other way, but okay. Like she just yeah. gets on with it. I'm gonna yeah. go out with a bang. Yeah. I, what is your favorite thing about the world you created? Oh, I think it would be the dragon moons. Yeah. 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 That's just like, it's so fast. Like, how do you even get an idea like that? Like that's oh, just like, like I, they literally like just fell on me. Like I was in the bath, like just you know stealing moments where I'm like living in this world, and I I just saw them. I was like, oh whoa! <laughs> and again, like I was just a goner. Like it, I just I knew that I had to really kneel to this, you know, and, and do it justice. So it's one of the reasons why I really took my time with the story. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's so unique, and it's so beautiful. Uh, what is your favorite non-bookish activity? What do you like to do when you're not writing or reading? <laughs> <laughs> Apart from having three kids and having no time. <laughs> I don't think I have any hobbies. <laughs> I'm just realizing now. Um, um, oh, actually, my dog. <laughs> she's down here. Uh, yeah. She's definitely, she's my, I, I, I adore her. She's, oh, oh God, my plants. My plants. There we go. Oh, there, I've got a hobby. Yay. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Plants and pets are definitely hobbies. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There we go. <laughs> oh, I love a caring I, heart. You like to care for things, including I plants. Don't. And yeah. pets and children. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I, and I, I also spend quite a lot of time over in New Zealand um, and with my family and um, we go fishing there. So I like spending our time out on the boat with dad. And um, But I also snowboard. So we do um, snow trips once a year and and um, we took all three of our kids to Japan recently. So, um, yeah, I, I, I love snowboarding as well. But obviously I, I live in Queensland, so that's very <laughs> few and far between. <laughs> and there's like really no decent skiing, like snow in Australia. You really have to go to New Zealand or Japan yeah. or somewhere else because yeah or you drive 15 hours you know outside of Sydney which we've done before but um yeah not not recently oh, meanwhile man. I'm like 20 minutes from a ski resort where don't I live, tell I live me in that. <laughs> don't tell um, me that I can be we can be at the lift in 20 minutes oh my heart <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm so jealous oh <laughs> This is yeah. making a lot of sense to me now, the inspiration around like the, the the snow and the moon plumes and a love of the cold. Like I'm, I'm now understanding that there's obviously something that you hold close to your heart. Get oh, yeah. a, are you from the North Island or the South Island of New Zealand? I'm from originally? the North Island. Yeah. So um, I didn't really get a lot of exposure to the snow until I was a bit, bit older and, you know, and Josh and I um, got together. But since then, it's been a, a trip a year usually to the snow, if not, if not more. But we, um, there's been plenty of trips where we've been the very last ones on the mountain, barely making it back, you know, before like like the lifts have closed and we've had to like scale the mountain to get back. But like, you know, we've seen the most spectacular sunsets and like literally been basic, like the only people in sight. So it's, yeah, pretty, pretty wild. So definitely some inspirations come from that. Oh, amazing. Okay. What is your favorite trope and what is your least favorite trope? Oh, good question. Um, hmm. Favorite trope would be, I think, oh, I love the one bed trope. I love yeah. the one bed trope. <laughs> I, I don't think I can get past that. You know, <laughs> love the one bed trope. Um, I, oh, I can, I, I'm going to do two. Oh, who did this to you as well? I mean, yep. you can't. Oh, Sorry, yeah, that's a good, it's always a good line. Always. Yeah. 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 Um, I just love that energy around there. Um, especially when it's, oh, yeah, no, I'm not going to go into that. Um, but so least favorite. Oh, oh, golly, this is hard. Um, I think, I think cheating. I think cheating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah, I, 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 I really struggle as well if there's an unredeemable, um, main male character that has like really treated the female wrong in the past. I, yes. I, 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 I struggle to move past that. You know. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I think those. That's the those morally grey that's gone a step too far. Yeah, there is a line for me. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I, yeah, so I, I, it's, yeah, there's definitely, but yeah, mainly cheating, I think. That's, yeah, that's yeah. Me as, as a... I think something that's really interesting in your book, and I'm sidetracking here, mm. is because a lot of people don't like a pregnancy trope, right? And mm. we had a chat about this because we said, I love how you brought this into this book because it's yeah. like you've, kind of had a pregnancy trope but you haven't had a pregnancy trope like yeah. there's been a pregnancy in the past and now yeah. that baby is actually a full grown blown adult who actually yeah. is like possibly older than Ray but like really kind of blows your mind when you're like wait she's, she's been alive yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Been out of- content for more time <laughs> yeah 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 but yes. um, I love how you brought that in did you want to talk about that at all was that like intentional was there like very um, intentional yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, no, that was very intentional. I um, I, I, I so I'm interested. I'm interesting here. I, I sometimes like reading a pregnancy trope, uh, but it really depends on the story. Like, um, for instance, if it's a shifter wolf story, you know, like I, there's one in particular series that I read recent. Oh, I say recent. It was a couple of years ago. Um, but there was that, that trope was used, and I and I ate it up. Like I was fully yeah. there for. I was. I was. You know, if it's done well, <laughs> I really love that trope. Oh, but, I actually like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then sometimes I'm sometimes I'm not super into it. Um, just depends, really. Um, but yeah, f- for this one, it was it was absolutely intentional. Um, I, you know, I wanted to explore it in a different way, and um, obviously, yeah, I just looking forward to you guys reading book two. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a No, when there's a purpose behind it, I think some stories you have it where it kind of happens, but it's like that's kind of the big, big epic ending, and you're sort of like, okay, that's you know a bit typical. But when it's got this important, like, like I think in your books, it's an integral, really important role that it's going to have in the future. So it's very, very important. I love how it's been tied in because if anyone's a bit like, I don't love a pregnancy trope, it's like, well, it happened like a hundred years ago. It's gone. Actually, yeah, you're all like, and they've been a toddler running around and it ruining our romance. Again. <laughs> no, no, that's all done and dusted yeah. so it's yeah. perfect I love it yeah 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 and, and it's funny too because I mean I'm at a different stage in my life now too like we've had our kids and you know and and it was yeah I think it's uh, it really allows me to I think explore rave and you know in certain mindset not knowing about this and then obviously after knowing about that and we get to you know we get to grow with her as this you know from all these different levels and book one then then book two prior to learning this and then you know onwards and onwards so yeah it's um yeah I'm yeah all right I've got to get back on track I'm, I'm totally right let's get back let's get back <laughs> to rapid I fire it. I'm not very good at rapid fire <laughs> I know. we love it though because we're just like we want to get eat up all those little pieces they're so interesting okay can you describe what you think is the scariest type of villain? Like, are they sadistic? Are they intelligent? Are they a monster? What's the scariest type of villain? Oh, for me, it is um, intelligent because I I feel like I feel like this when those clogs are really ticking, and you know, like that that intelligence can sometimes lead a character to really dark places. You know, it's like when it, when a world is so open inside somebody's head it's like suddenly they they make sense of things in a way that in in such in an unhealthy way and and it can just lead down really dark paths so um yeah i think intelligence is is a can, can sometimes be a blessing and a curse because I, a lot of people you know not knowing how to deal with that intelligence not knowing how to handle it um you know i think there are some very scary scary uh individuals in our past um that have been very very intelligent and have and have just you know did terrible things so yeah i think intelligence is is scary (laughs) exactly we're not well to plan it really really well yeah Yeah, i 100 agree with that okay what is your ultimate spice level mild spice medium spice hot spice very hot spice so hot you're dying but if you had to die it's probably a good way to go <laughs> <laughs> oh I think I'm more medium because I I definitely like my spice to have meaning um and I don't want it too early because otherwise I'm then like oh <laughs> you know <laughs> if, I, if I'm waiting for the spice, I want to be kept on that edge like I like being edged in a book <laughs> <laughs> and then I, then I like those fireworks to go off. So, yeah, I think maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. The Goldilocks level of spice, we like to yeah, say. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Is it okay to kill off a main character? 
Do you mean one of the like main male, main female character and main male character, like main the main yeah, main character? Main, yeah, up to you how you want to interpret that question. A main yeah. character, maybe like your top four characters or something like that. Oh, look, <laughs> I'm just gonna pass on this. <laughs> so I have read stories in the past where I've gotten to a certain area and I've realized, and I, then I've realize and then I've read spoilers and realized that certain main characters die and I've been like no nope. <laughs> you know I've thrown my hands up literally in protest so I I uh I I do I do love I I love I love a happy ending but I'm also I also I want it to make sense. I don't want to be given a happy ending just because. I want, I want, I do want there to be casualties, but I want it to be hard to get there. I want it to be rough to get there. I want that payoff to be there. And but, I, but overall, I, I want, I want, I want a happy ending. You know, as a reader. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, no like red wedding kind of thing to be afraid of. <laughs> Good. Okay. What is the best romanticy romantic environment? Would it be like a hot, humid private hideaway by a lake or a wintry ice realm castle with a roaring fire and one bed? That one. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing your answer before, I was like, I should be quite a answer to this going. already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, done. <laughs> Sold. Okay, final question. What is one thing you can tell us about book two? Hmm. You see me again. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, that's a good. That's a good one. I like that a lot. I like that answer a lot. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for answering our rapid fire questions and our pass or answer questions. We have um thoroughly explored all of these questions today so thank you so much for doing your best to answer them, as we said um we've learned lots of exciting things today and we are looking very forward to book two and i can't wait to so, get to you all yeah. <laughs> so is it so, still like fall 2025 is that what you're thinking what was in the back of uh when the moon hatched yeah i think i think um avon and um and harper voyager have it booked in for october next year so okay. i mean i will have the first draft hopefully done in the next six weeks and then i'll be having my betas and alphas take a look at it and i'll be getting it to my editors in um october this year so it'll be written well before then but um yeah, so, uh, but it obviously then has to go through the process with the trad and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I think it's October oh, next year. Cool. Okay. Very, very Good exciting. Thing. Not that we want to rush you because obviously if it took three years to kind of create the first one, you know, we want it to be the same. So we're very excited, but yeah. we're looking forward to We'll have something to look forward to in 2025. So yeah. if, if any of our listeners want to connect with you or want to find the best place to find your books, um, where is the best place for them to find your books and connect with you? The best place to connect with me and find my books would be my Instagram. I'm That's where I spend most of my time, although I am very quiet on there at the moment just because I'm neck deep in book two and I like to sort of preserve my space. Um, so, yeah, definitely Instagram. Um, I All my updates go on there, my stories, and I've got a link to my website there, which is also in my website, has a link to my link tree, which has all, all the places to find my books and, and whatnot. So, yeah, definitely, definitely Instagram is the best place to find me. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today and stepping away from writing book two to talk with us. We've appreciated it so much. Thank you so much for creating this amazing book. It really is, we're truly honestly saying it is truly something special. Um, It really just such a standout, not just for this year, but honestly, I think it's going to end up being one of like the big like romantic books that like everyone is going to get on board and read. So thank you so much for creating it. Thank you so much for your time today. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And let's repeat when I've done book two. Yes. yes. Oh my God, we are getting you back a thousand percent. We are going to like, we're finally going to be able to ask all those questions. You're actually going to be able to answer. Yeah, I know. Them. I know. <laughs> oh. All righty. Well, until all then, right. thank you so much again. And yeah, it's been fantastic. All right. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for listening. Please jump on and subscribe or jump on to uh, Book Loverholic or Alley Cats and Books. And we will see you next time. Thanks. Bye.